Good afternoon, everyone. That's it? Yeah. Come on, man. We're up here. We're up here exposing our hearts and minds to the world. Let's try that again. Good afternoon, everyone. There we go. We are here to talk about building AI quickly, collaboratively, and with confidence using Colab on Vertex AI. I think I'm supposed to introduce us now. Okay, so I am uh, Nenshad Bardoliwala. I work for the Department of Motor Vehicles in the state of California, uh, but uh, it's just a reference to the keynote yesterday, but uh, I, my day job is I actually run the product management team for uh, the Vertex ML platform. And I am joined by my esteemed colleague who is very humble, but he's one of the OGs of the Vertex team. He's been on this for what, five years? Yeah. Five years, so before when Vertex was just a little baby, Karthik was the daddy. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Karthik Ramachandran. I'm on Nenshad's team. I'm a group product manager, and I am uh, uh, going to talk about Colab Enterprise today. So ask, if you guys like the product, tell me. Uh, if you don't like the product, also tell me, but preferably not too loudly. <laughs> yeah, because I'll hear it. <laughs> I will hear it. Okay, so let's do a, a product introduction and overview. That'll be me. Then I'll turn it over to Karthik and he'll walk you through uh, some of the details. Okay, so what is Colab Enterprise? First of all, let's get a show of hands. How many of you actually use Colab uh, in your day to day work? Fantastic. So uh, that's going to remain an amazing product available for uh, consumers, but we now have an enterprise version. Okay, and so it has all the capabilities of what you see in Colab uh, today, but it also brings all the enterprise level security capabilities, compliance support, repeatability, et cetera, that you need if you wanna run this at scale in your business. Okay. So history of Colab, uh, it launched in November of 2017. Uh, what then happened is by November of 2019, it got to 1 million users. That is not easy to do for any product, but Colab just took off. People got uh, very excited by it. Uh, AlphaFold launched on Colab in July of 2021. And uh, in June of 2023, we added some really cool features. I don't know how many of you have used it yet, but we're kind of into this whole code assistance thing. Uh, hopefully you heard about Duet yesterday as well as our uh, Cody models. And so uh, AI code assistance, made its way into uh, Colab, the consumer version of Colab. And uh, then we introduced a really cool feature in July called auto charting. You actually can take a data frame and ask the system to go and generate the right type of chart. Uh, and the system will kind of automatically do that for you. Uh, just a small note, but in the preview, actually every time you submitted that, Karthik would draw the diagram for you in the background. <laughs> Now the software actually does it. Uh, and here we are in August of 2023, and uh, Colab is now ready as an enterprise product. It's ready for all of you to start using today, and uh, we're really excited for you to start taking advantage of some of its capabilities. Now, one of the great things about working in Google Cloud is that we have access to some of the most amazing research uh, from our Google DeepMind and research teams. And one of the cool things that we get to do as product managers here, uh, in, in addition to giving demos about the Department of Motor Vehicles, is that we actually get to take research that comes out of our research team and productize that. And I think you've seen some pretty amazing examples. Uh, we started this journey with uh, something named after uh, one of the founders, uh, Kids Elephant. How many of you remember Hadoop? Remember when that was the craze? Yeah, yeah, I still have the t-shirts. My wife won't let me wear them anymore, they're too old, but I still have them. So we started our journey in 2003 actually taking Hadoop. We took some of that technology and of course commercialized it, but we also always have a parallel path for taking things and bringing them uh, into the open source world. And so I think the first set of libraries that really started to democratize uh, and bring uh, to a broad market neural networks was actually TensorFlow. How many of you have actually coded against TensorFlow? People? Good. Awesome. And so, uh, you know, we brought TensorFlow to the market. We've brought Kubernetes to the market. And these were all technologies that were used inside of Google 
but then we decided to make to, you know, available to a broader audience. But we also try to provide these capabilities directly in the cloud. So you can see examples, our AutoML product, for example, uh, is one that came out of Google Research and then we productized. Uh, NAS, Neural Architecture Search, uh, it is not the wrapper NAS, uh, he is not part of our roadmap, but Neural Architecture Search uh, became a product in the Google portfolio, it's still available today. And then you see more recent uh, capabilities. In fact, uh, how many of you know that Transformers, the technology behind all this Gen AI stuff, actually was developed at Google in 2017? Yes, thank you for raising your hands. Uh, diffusion models. So if you've seen things like stable diffusion, who invented that technology? Google, Google Research. And now, you know, given where we are in 2023, we have this amazing partnership with Google Research and Google Cloud where we can take capabilities like those models and like Colab, which was actually built by Google Research, and bring it to all of you in an enterprise context. So we work really, really closely together, and it's fun. So uh, one of the big things that all of you told us is that uh, you wanted to be able to use these type of notebook environments across multiple Google products. And confession, we haven't always been great about that. Okay, we're not perfect, but we do try to listen to your feedback and get better. So with Colab Enterprise, how, how many of you heard the announcement yesterday about BigQuery Studio? Remember hearing that? Yeah. So the Colab Enterprise in BigQuery Studio is the exact same Colab Enterprise in Vertex. So those of you who want to do things like uh, build, your, uh, build your data sets and do feature engineering using BigQuery data and using big frames and some of that technology, you could do that in Colab. Now you have your data set and you want to start doing some uh, you know, plotting or statistics, uh, descriptive statistics on top of that, you could do that in Colab. You decide you want to train a model and now you want to do that in Vertex or you can use BQML, you could do that in Colab. And then deploy, of course, these models uh, from Colab. So it's a single environment that spans the entire data to AI journey, which makes things a lot easier than having to go through four or five different tools to get one job done for one, uh, one persona or type of user. Okay, is let get, let's get started. Is that the cue for you to do your dance? Yeah, that's, that's the demo. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and switch over to the demo machine. And let's not let that play because we don't want to do that. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, Nyancha just mentioned, Colab Enterprise is available both through Vertex and through BigQuery Studio. I'm gonna go ahead and bring it up in Vertex right now. So um, what happens when it pops up is you can see that there are two distinct panels on the screen. On the left-hand side is a, notebook, a managed notebook storage, and on the right-hand side is where the editor will pop up. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new notebook. What this does behind the scenes is it creates a managed IPYNB file. It's industry standard IPYNB. You can upload your existing notebooks to the service and everything should just kind of work. Um, and it does it in the region, US Central 1, that uh, I've specified. Now, I, uh, I'm stopping on this point and just kind of talking about it for a little bit because if you use Colab today, you'll notice that it's a drive-based product. Um, one of the things we did when we brought this product to cloud is we introduced managed notebook storage that is compliant with all of GCP security capabilities and uh, compliances. So you'll find that um, the notebook storage does behave a little bit differently, but it's very much uh, on track to be feature, um, uh, at feature parity between the two offerings. Now, the next thing I did is I actually just executed this first code cell in the notebook. And what happened here is that the notebook connected to a runtime, a virtual machine that's running in the same region and is private to this user, me, uh, and it executed the code that's there. This is actually uh, using the default runtime, which is an N2 standard two. It's a fully managed short-lived VM that we allocate as you start executing code, just so you don't have to do any configuration to get started. You just hit play, you get the compute you need, it runs. Wait, but Karthik, I use these products every day. I have to set up networking and VPC SC. I have to yodel at a certain uh, volume in order to get this all set up. Did you just tell me that I could open this and get, just get started right away? What a wonderful prompt. Uh, yes, you absolutely can. And 
We also understand that people have needs where they want maybe larger machines, they want different machines, they want access to the full power of all the accelerators available on GCP. They may need to con configure networking or organizational policies. We have another mechanism in the product that I'll show you in a second for doing this. But for right now, let's just hang out with our friend the default runtime. And I'm gonna go ahead and start the demo talking about the thing that absolutely nobody else is talking about, which is uh, code generation and generative AI. I'm sure you haven't heard mention of it yet, um, but the product actually comes with two uh, code gen features, um, code complete and code gen. Uh, code complete, you can just start typing in stuff and as it figures out what you're typing in, it should be able to do things like give you that suggestion, Keras load model. I don't actually like that one, so maybe I'll do um, model equals sequence, and hopefully it'll at some point figure out that I'm trying to do sequences. Um, as you notice, this code generation stuff will get better as you type in more code into the notebook. It'll use the entirety of the context that you provide in the notebook uh, to generate code. It'll likewise do the same thing uh, with the code generation feature. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that, and I'm gonna click create. And I'm gonna say, hey, can you give me some PyTorch code for classifying an image in MNIST dataset? And it helps if you can type and not make too many errors. Um, oh, sorry, I actually wanna hit the generate button. There it goes. So what have we here? We have PyTorch code that loads the MNIST dataset from TorchVision and trains a model. Um, in addition to the code, you get the recitation, the set of sources that were actually important in gendering this code. Now, I'm a, a longtime Googler, as Lenchard mentioned, so I'm not as big a fan of PyTorch as some people, and I kind of prefer Keras. So let me go over and do that. Great. It also gave me Keras code for training data based on the MNIST um, data set. But Karthik, is this just a stock example? No, it actually isn't. Uh, this is actually really nerve wracking to be up here right now because uh, this could have done something else and given you a slightly different code sample. Uh, this one actually looks like it will run in about a few seconds, I'm actually gonna hit play and see if it does. And uh, well, for the sake of the demo, I really hope it does. But before I do that, let me show you one other cool thing. And I can just kind of say, summarize the above code in bullet points. Again, uh, my spelling skills do need some work, but gives you a nice little summary of the code, which you could then maybe go in and drop in as a, um, as a comment into this. Anyways, I like that, uh, I like that particular trick. It's, it's pretty useful. Again, as you put in, build up your notebook and start adding more stuff, the code completion, the code generation is gonna get smarter. It's gonna give you more useful and more relevant uh, results because the entire context that you provide in the notebook is being used to inform those, those recommendations. Uh, now comes the fun part uh, for you, maybe less so for me, and I'm gonna actually hit the play button, and we're gonna see what happens here. So, so far so good. It's actually downloading and running uh, this code, and now it's actually turning a uh, model. I wanna take a moment while this is happening to talk about compute again. So right now, this is running on the N2 standard four machine that is the default machine for this notebook. Um, this is a deep learning model. It's not the deepest learning model you could come up with, but it is deep learning, and it would probably benefit from having a GPU uh, available to it. Now, we have um, one of the big and powerful features of Colab Enterprise is the ability to access all of the GPUs that are available on Google Cloud. And the way you can do that is through the runtime templates feature. I'm gonna actually stop that and go ahead and flip over to the runtime templates. So creating, uh, accessing more powerful compute on Colab Enterprise is a two-step process. First step is an administrator creates a runtime template. Second step is the user instantiates a runtime based on that template. 
Um, I'm going to step back and give you just a little bit of context around why we decided to set this up this way. On the one hand, we know that many users are going to want a lot, of, uh, a lot more powerful compute than is on the standard. But at the same time, what folks who uh, run data science teams, run platform teams tell us, is they want some control over the types of resources that users spin up, in the regions they spin up. They want to be able to set certain configurations. Maybe they need to run them on certain VPCs, or maybe they need to disable external IPs, things like that. This is where runtime templates comes in. The idea is we want to give you, as an administrator, the ability to control the type of compute that your users use, while still giving your users as much flexibility as possible uh, to be able to spin up what they need when they need it. So the process for creating a template is pretty simple. You click New Template, you go ahead and run through this D-step process. For example, let's say I want to do a deep learning runtime template. Uh, I've been executing everything in US Central 1, so I'll keep it in that region. You could eventually add labels, other types of metadata to this. You can then pick the machine. Um, you can, if you want to give your users access to say A100s, you have the full A2 line. If you're looking for L4s, you have the G2 line there. Um, in this case, I'm going to go ahead and pick something like an N1 HiMem 16, and that lets me attach an NVIDIA Tesla T4 or V100. The next step is I can specify some networking and security configurations here as well. I've already created a, a template that fulfills this basic format, uh, deep learning templates with T4s. Now, once you as an administrator have done that, your users, when they actually want to use it, can go ahead and go back to the notebook. I'm going to go ahead and make that full screen and click on this connect to a runtime button up here. Now, you get two options here. You get to create a new runtime, and you can do it from a template. Uh, and what will happen is we'll spin up the machine as you specified it for the user to use. That machine will be private to that user. Or you can connect to an existing runtime. I've actually already got a, um, a, a runtime made from that particular um, template spun up, so I'm going to go ahead and use that right now, and we're going to go ahead and connect to it. We're now connected to that, and I'm going to rerun this code, but then I'm going to show you that I'm actually now running this on um, a machine that has a T4 GPU attached to it. I want to open up the built-in terminal, and you'll see that we have, um, in, uh, we have all the NVIDIA tools installed on the runtime for your users to work with. I want to run NVIDIA SMI. That's going to show you that I have a T4 running, and that is now currently being utilized at 17% uh, by this model that's being trained here. And um, there it goes. Now, um, while that's running, I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about um, collaboration. So I'm really happy with this notebook. I think it's great. Um, I want to, of course, share it with my boss, Nenshad, uh, so that he can tell me how wonderful I am, uh, which is, that's what he will normally do, is just, you know, sing my praises. <laughs> and anyways. Is this uh, the right talk? <laughs> <laughs> so, you can go to the um, notebook browser, you can click on share, and we actually enable sharing via IAM permissions. So this is the standard sharing mechanism across Google Cloud, or the standard permissioning mechanism across Google Cloud. Uh, all you have to do is click share. You can go ahead and say, hey, I want to share this with Nenshad. There he is, and I can give him, uh, I actually want to give him code editor access, and there you go. He now has code editor access to this notebook. He can come in, he can run it, he can do whatever he wants. Likewise, when somebody shares a notebook with me, I'll see it under the shared with me tab in the notebook editor. Again, everything is regionalized. One of the core foundations of how we design Colab Enterprise is to really respect regionalization. That is something I know that's really important for a lot of folks um, here. Now, in addition to sharing, the other fun feature that we have is we actually also have built-in versioning. 
So the system every few minutes will go ahead and save a snapshot of the file, provided there are some changes that have been there. And you can, of course, compare the current version to the prior versions. Now, because this is a notebook, it's sometimes not the most helpful thing if, uh, to do this because you'll see the outputs. We thought of that and we allow you to remove the output from the diff so you can see just the portions that are um, your code. You can also, of course, restore and revert to a prior revision of this. So let's go back and see how our model training has actually uh, hopefully wrapped up while we were working through that. And it did, it did finish up and we ended up with a model that looks like it's probably pretty good. Its uh, accuracy is 0.98. So, you know, this is, this is awesome. I do want to just stop here and say, um, you know, six or seven years ago, training in a data set for MNIST to this level of accuracy was a research challenge, right? Uh, let alone having the code to do that written by AI. That wasn't something that was happening, you know, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, so this is, you know, I know this is a demo that people have probably seen variants of a number of products, but it's still pretty spectacular how far we've come. Uh, now that I've finished pontificating, I'm going to go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about how uh, Colab Enterprise is integrated with both BigQuery and Vertex. So what I wanted to do here was I just wanted to run through a very simple example with a very common data set, the Penguins data set, to show you how we could very easily pull data from BigQuery, use BQML to train a model, uh, have that all integrated with Vertex model registry. So you can kind of do everything from a fairly small set of APIs. So here I'm just using the stock BQ client to go ahead and pull data from the public data set. Uh, if you listen to the BigQuery Studio announcement, you'll know there's also a new API coming out called BigFrames that lets you load this into a BigQuery um, native data frame representation. Now, if you print out the data frame, you get that auto plot feature that Nenshad was talking about. There's actually two parts to it. The first is you can convert the data frame to an interactive table, and then you can go ahead and filter on any of the columns within it. Um, or you can just go ahead and click on this nifty button and the system will use some, some smarts to try and figure out what the visualizations of this data that are likely to be the most useful for you are. And you can take all the code that is generated and put it into, um, you can take all the plots that have been generated, you get the code for them, you can reuse them and work with them if you want. Now, once that's done, what I always notice about this particular example is these 2D distributions. For those who are familiar with the penguins data set, it's a goal is to build a classifier. You're given a bunch of measurements around individual penguins and you're supposed to figure out, hey, what species of penguin does this particular record um, belong to? And what this shows you is that, hey, likely this Coleman length and Coleman depth, they're probably pretty good predictors. And if I were building a model from scratch, that would be useful information. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna run BQML in kind of AutoML mode. And then Chad mentioned AutoML a little while ago. Here, all I really have to do is I have to tell BQML that I want to um, use a logistic regression that predicts on the column species uh, and then register the results of the Vertex AI model registry right now. This takes a couple of seconds to run, so I'm just gonna go ahead and pop over to Vertex AI model registry and show you what it looks like once it's actually done. So if I pop over to model registry, I have my Penguin's uh, LR6 logistic regression, six, sixth attempt, I should say. And just before I jump too far, actually, model registry is kind of the central repository for models in Vertex and BQML. Uh, all the models you train in BQML, all the models you train in Vertex can make their way here. And from here you can do a bunch of stuff. So in this particular case, I could um, go ahead and create an evaluation job. I can deploy it. It's actually already got a live endpoint. I could create a batch prediction job. I can create um, everything's version so I can see multiple versions of this. I'm gonna go ahead and click on this view in BQML, and I'm gonna use this uh, opportunity to show you two things. First of all, I'm gonna show you that the model is also 
available via BigQuery Studio. So you see it right here and you can see the training metrics. You can see the evaluation metrics. Second thing that I wanted to point out is, as Nenshad said, all the notebooks that you work with in Vertex are also reflected here in BigQuery Studio under the notebook section. And then the third thing I really want to show you here is that I talked about how these VMs use the end user's personal credentials. For those who have used notebook products on Vertex before or in GCP, you know that in the past we used service accounts as the uh, authentication mechanism. And what that meant is you couldn't keep track of the user's activities from the notebook into our other services. We now use the end user's credentials. So if the user calls BigQuery from within the notebook, they will see um, that is traceable now. They will, it'll run on their own credentials. You'll see their identity and so on. So with that said, I'm gonna flip it back over to um, Nenshad for a slide or two. And maybe we can switch back to the um, thing, okay. Actually, let me take the next slide here, next two slides. It's very hurtful. I'm sorry. You just handed it to me and now you're taking yeah, it back? Yeah, I'm gonna take it back. That's hurtful. Okay. I'm sorry about that. I hurt Nenshad's feelings. That may show up on my perf, we'll see. Um, anyways, uh, just as a quick review of what we did, we did uh, code completion, code generation, auto plot. From the other key features we talked about were collaboration, IAM-based notebook sharing, automatic versioning. Then we talked about um, how we have zero config compute option as well as a configurable flexible compute option. And then we haven't talked a lot about enterprise horizontals, but as we get the product through its life cycle and get it into GA and beyond, we'll be supporting a kind of full set of uh, GCP security capabilities. Now. Oh, now I get it? Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you. All right. Okay. So I just want to walk through the stack so that we understand where these capabilities fit into the overall uh, Vertex set of offerings. So the first part, of course, which is not a direct part of Vertex, is the Google Cloud infrastructure. Okay? And of course, we depend on this very heavily. Uh, we have state-of-the-art capabilities with GPUs. You saw Jensen Huang on, on stage yesterday. Uh, but we also announced the new version of our TPUs, uh, V5e, I think, if I got it correctly. And we continue to invest to make sure that we provide the absolute best rock-solid hardware that you can use for uh, AI and machine learning. The second layer, of course, is the model garden. And uh, you would have seen that yesterday as well. And the idea for us is that we're very proud of our first party models, the one that we've built ourselves like Palm and Cody and Imagine. But the fact is that even at the scale of Google, we can't build everything ourselves, right? And so uh, we've, we've made our approach very open. We provide a ton of open source models. You saw uh, Llama and Code Llama yesterday, but we also have Stable Diffusion and many, many others that we provide inside of the uh, model garden environment. And the idea is you should have the choice. If you want to use an open source model that allows you to do what you uh, want to do, you should, you should be able to use it. There's no reason you have to use uh, Google's models. Then the AI platform is what traditionally we've called as Vertex. Actually now Vertex AI <laughs> encompasses this whole thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a branding shift, but uh, it's important to know. So uh, the AI platform represents all the capabilities around being able to build and evaluate models. So that includes notebooks, that includes our training service, that includes our model evaluation services uh, and the like. It includes all the services around being able to, what ML engineers use to put models into production. So this is things like uh, pipelines and our prediction service and the feature store and, and uh, this collection of capabilities. And then of course, many of the pre-built APIs that we can use in order to be able to uh, solve specific use cases without having to do a lot of configuration. And one of the things that, that we're very proud of is that we have built all of the generative AI support in Vertex directly into the platform. We haven't outsourced it to somebody else uh, so you, all the skills that you've built on Vertex already, whether it's using our notebooks or using our training service or using our uh, inference service, 
everything that you did for predictive AI, the generative AI stuff uses the exact same platform. So all the security, the compliance, uh, the way we use GPUs and TPUs is exactly the same. Uh, and that is not the same approach that uh, some of the other folks in the market have taken. Okay. Then we have two package, uh, package systems that we provide. One is search. This is enterprise search, so being able to search on your data uh, and being able to ground the results. How many of you have heard this term hallucination? Right, yeah, that's not just for Grateful Dead concerts anymore. It, it also happens with these large models. Thank you, I've got the reference. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, these models actually will make things up. And so being able to ground your data uh, and, and show empirically that the result you're looking at on the screen is actually uh, derived from data that you actually have in your corpus is really, really important. And that's where search comes in. And then of course, conversation. Uh, everybody is, is in uh, chatbot land. I think you know every, everywhere you go, you're seeing people come up with new versions and new iterations. Uh, but these can be very complex. It's not just about information seeking. You can actually do entire transactions inside of uh, a, a chat interface. And so uh, all of these build on top of each other. So actually, uh, the AI platform uh, powers many of the large language model capabilities in search powers many of the large language model capabilities inside of uh, conversation. Then there are solutions some of you may use uh, in your businesses today. These are things like uh, Doc AI, which continues to get new innovation, or our contact center AI capabilities, et cetera. But the key point I, you know, I want to emphasize to everyone is that you know, Vertex has become this very, very rich platform. It's not just the, just the core infrastructural capabilities, but many of these higher, higher level services. And uh, Colab integrates really well with all of them. So if you choose to use Colab because you want to do, in fact, in the model garden, when you click on fine tuning an open source model, it'll open up a Colab notebook. We want all of these services to integrate and work well together so that you can get to productivity quickly. Uh, it's not fun having to stitch together a bunch of services. You know, we, we know that. And so we've, we've, we're trying to make it a lot easier and make the entire Vertex stack, which now includes search and conversation in these other areas, work really nicely and, and, and help all of you get to productivity quicker. I think it's back to you. Oh, thank you. Um, sure. So uh, this slide is for those who are already using uh, Vertex Workbench. And the question we often get is, how do we think about the differences between Workbench and JupyterLab? So, you know, Workbench is built on JupyterLab, industry standard, very familiar to a lot of your users, a lot of data scientists and analysts live in JupyterLab today. Uh, the product is very uh, flexible, very customizable, and again, it's open in the sense that it's built on the open source version of JupyterLab. So you can do a lot of customizations, you can bring in extensions, things like that. It's a good choice for data scientists who are already using JupyterLab, maybe on their laptop and you'd like to transition them onto the cloud. It's also good if you're working with very complex projects where you have things spanning multiple files, maybe you have shell scripts and Python scripts and uh, other things in there. Um, it's really nice in that scenario and it's got a really nice set of native Git support built right into it. Colab Enterprise, on the other hand, is kind of designed to be more of a zero config serverless experience. It's very focused on collaboration. It's excellent for users who don't want to manage or worry about compute at all. They just want to hit go and start typing and run their code. Um, it's great for projects that can be encapsulated in a single notebook. And it's for, good for users who don't want to worry about Git, where that built-in versioning is going to help them keep track of their work and avoid data loss without having to do, and do a bunch of Git commands. So that's how we think about both of these products and, and how they live in the market and the types of uses they might be uh, applicable towards. So going with the theme of, of Vertex is now kind of one large platform where we're trying to take you all the way through the ML journey, I want to use the next demo in the next few minutes to talk about how you could fine tune a foundation model using our SDK from within Colab Enterprise. Uh, how many people out of curiosity are thinking about fine tuning foundation models, the Gen AI models? Okay, so good amount. I think about it multiple times a day, oh, yeah. That's great, that's great. Um, so uh, in that sense, 
this is this is probably how a lot of ml is going to be done in the future you're probably not going to start with nothing you're going to start with one of these foundation models you're going to take your company's data or your data or data specific to the problem you're trying to solve fine tune and that's going to be how you get a really performant thing so this is a really important use case and we want to make sure that we make it as simple as possible so if we could flip back to the demo computer I'll go ahead and show you um, how simple we do make it. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and pop into Model Garden. Again, in the, in the theme of showing you how we're trying to make sure everything comes together and doesn't feel as like a bunch of individual services, but one cohesive platform. You can pick any of the existing foundation models or any of the fine-tunable models that we have from various sources. And if you click on them, you will often get a link that says open notebook. Uh, and what this does is it will open a notebook in Colab Enterprise that gives you instructions how to work with that particular model. Uh, and then you could execute that particular notebook. Now, uh, I've actually made a slightly simplified version that shows you how to tune text person, as uh, I have labeled this so helpfully, demo three. And I think what I really want to just emphasize is like how simple this is. So first thing I'm going to do is I want to do some setup. I'm going to you know, put in my project ID, regions, uh, define a service account that can be used. And then from within the SDK, I just say, hey, I need to pull the list of text generation models, right? And then I'm going to pull from the pre-trained set and I give it the name of the pre-trained model that I want to work with. In this case, text bison. And then you, know, you can immediately test and see if it works right. You can do model.predict, give it a prompt, and it'll give you back uh, a response there. Now, to tune the model, it's literally this block of code right here. Model.tune model. You give it your training data, you specify some uh, parameters, and then you specify where you want the job to run. Uh, and then you click on play. Now what happens when this happens? This actually creates a vertex pipeline job, and I'm gonna go ahead and click over so you can see that pipeline job in action for a second. And so for those who aren't familiar with vertex pipelines, this is a machine learning orchestration system. It's built on top of Kubeflow pipelines. And what you're seeing here is a pipeline that actually goes through and does all the things necessary to tune a model uh, using a, a fairly efficient algorithm for doing that. Um, and then once it's done tuning the model, it actually goes ahead and it deploys that model to an endpoint so you can start testing it. This pipeline takes a little while to execute, about 30 to 40 minutes or so. So I'm gonna actually go ahead and show you one that's done by clicking on this view all tuning jobs button. I do have to pick the right uh, region. Uh, and you can see I've been, I've been doing this a lot. Uh, I've been practicing my demo quite often. Um, so I'm gonna pick one that I've already uh, got set up here. And I'm gonna actually click on the test button here. And what you can see is that that immediately takes me to, um, uh, to the prompt uh, library here, but you can go ahead and ask it, you know, you can provide prompts and test it. So I can say, hey, tell me the best things about Vertex AI. And um, it should give me back, hopefully, a nice, nice set of things about Vertex AI. You know, simplicity, power, flexibility, security. These are all things we want to talk about. And literally, that's, that's all that you had to do to tune this model. That, that model does live in the model registry that we talked about earlier. Um, you can see it here, you can see it's been deployed, you can look at the endpoints, you can kind of do whatever you want to do uh, from, this, from this point here. Now, uh, sorry, flip over to US Central 1 to show you that. Uh, this model was trained in, in the Netherlands but uh, deployed in Iowa, so it's, it's quite a global model, uh, as you can see. So with that said, um, Let's say I want to now evaluate a model. And the question now becomes, how do I do that? 
I want to go ahead and flip back to Colab Enterprise for a second, and I want to show you the code sample that actually does that. And uh, it's equivalently straightforward. There isn't a lot more that you have to do here. It's simply you get the tune model that you just tuned, and you have to provide the identifier to it. And then you actually provide your ground truth data, picking a particular task, and you do model.evaluate. And again, this spins up a vertex pipeline that you can go take a look at. And then in the model registry, all of these results are um, registered, and you can kind of see how they compare to each other if you're doing multiple runs or multiple versions. For example, this particular uh, model, I've been training and tuning in a couple of different ways and um, evaluating with a few different sets. So I can go ahead and see, oops, I don't want to do that. I can go ahead and see the, the different metrics from the different runs I've done and how they compare up against each other. Uh, and so, Again, the point we're trying to make here, I think, is that we've tried to bring this all together into one cohesive platform. We have an SDK that makes it very easy for you to execute this foundation model tuning eval process. So if we can flip back to the slides. So let's just go ahead and Okay, so the, just to the recap here is, you know, we pulled, that, we pulled that foundation model, we initiated a tuning job, it ran on vertex pipelines, it generated some adapter layers, uh, and then the model was registered with model registry. Uh, it then served that model in a pretty efficient way, applying the new adapter layers, uh, and then you could call that model and, and test it and see what happened. So that is um, the entirety of the workflow. It took maybe you know, less than 20 lines of code to execute and do, so very, very straightforward. Everything's built on top of Vertex Pipelines, technology that many of you already use and are familiar with. And um, so overall, I think that we're making a lot of good progress towards making some of these key um, workflows very, very simple for you. Um, I'm just going to close out here. I'd hope to have a little bit more time for questions, but it looks like we won't have that by saying uh, Collab Enterprise is in public preview uh, today. It's available via the Vertex UI if you go look at it. If you want to access it via BigQuery Studio, it is behind an allow list. Please contact your account representatives and they'll help you get on that. And the code generation feature is also behind an allow list. So if you want to access that, let us know and we'll get you on there as well. So thank you everyone for your time on the um, afternoon of the second day. And I hope those of you have happy hours to get to. I'm not standing in your way or anything else. So thank you and have a good day.